Hello and welcome to today's webinar on designing low power applications for LTE, M and NB IoT LPWA networks. My name is Jeremy Cowan and I'm Editorial Director and Co-Founder of IoT Now. And it's my very great pleasure to be your moderator today. Thank you all for joining us, wherever you are around the world. We've got a, a very topical discussion for you. It's brought to you with Tierra Wireless and Altair Semiconductor. Plus, we're delighted to have an overview from Beecham Research. So the first thing to do is to welcome our speakers, and they are in order of appearance, Severio Romeo, who is Principal Analyst at Beecham Research. Welcome, Severio. Welcome, and thank you, Jeremy, for having me here. Thank you. Great to have you. And then I'd like to introduce Nicolas Damour, who is Senior Manager, Business and Innovation Development at Sierra Wireless. Hello, Nicolas. Hello, nice to meet you. And our third speaker will be Dima Feldman, Director of Product Management at Altair Semiconductor. It's good to have you here, Dima. Hello, it's nice, very nice to be here. Be here. And finally, I'm delighted to say we'll be hearing from Sierra Wireless's Brian O'Flaherty Wills, and he is Senior Director, Product Management. IoT Solutions business line. A very warm welcome to you too, Brian. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks a lot for having me here. Now, don't forget, this um, webinar is being recorded, and from tomorrow you can access the audio and slides via our website at iot-now.com. As with all our webinars, we want to know what you think, and to answer that, we have three polls, the first of which comes in a moment, and at the end there's a great chance for you to question all our speakers. So you can start sending me your questions right now. I'll put them to our panel at the end. All you have to do is just click on the questions button and type yours into the window. And of course any that we don't get to will be answered later offline by our speakers. Finally, if you're having any technical issues with audio or slides, you can also use the question window to get advice from our tech support team. Today's webinar is for ever, anyone really thinking of deploying a battery or solar powered application or who just requires very low power for their IoT deployment. So without further ado, I'd really like to uh, ask Severio if he'd be able to give us the big picture uh, of LPWA networks. Severio, over to you. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to everyone. Give me this uh, uh, opportunity to contribute this, uh, to this webinar, which uh, looks at the one of the big team of 2018 for the IoT community. My contribution will be uh, quick and uh, and, and uh, hopefully insightful. I, I mean, in, in slides you are seeing now, uh, we are, um, you are seeing probably a chart that we've seen many times from us. Uh, it is important for us and I guess for the community because it gives you um, in one visualization <clears throat> where the IoT is basically uh, everywhere. We started to use this at the time of the M2M. At, the, at that time, um, we had probably uh, a very limited uh, options of connectivity. Instead, today, in the IoT scenario, uh, at least on the long range, as you can see from the charts, we have uh, a mix of possibilities, and these possibilities can be uh, can coexist in a sense that you can have a different type of connectivities in the same type of applications. Today we are discussing the emerging, um, if it's, to be honest, it's not emerging anymore, it's, 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 it's there, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in the marketplace of the LP1. And uh, as you can see, uh, in 2020, as Beecham Research, we believe that the LP1 <clears throat> will have a, a major, will be a major component of the connectivity mix on the long range. 
uh, as you can see, we, we, we think about 33% of connection coming from LP1. Now, in the LP1 here, we are including all the possible options you have. They are license ones and the license ones that we will discuss uh, we will discuss today. Now, why we believe uh, on the importance of LP1 and uh, it, this re-elaboration of our sector map is really to illustrate one main message. Uh, LP1 technologies and, uh, uh, and primarily the ones we are discussing today are enabling uh, all a set of new applications that probably uh, we didn't want to deploy before because the connectivity aspects was either too costly, uh, we had issue on, uh, on energy consumption, uh, we had issue on, uh, uh, on the range of, uh, of coverage, and um, the Healthy One technologies are coming here to respond to all those concerns. Uh, and, um, the, 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 we have at the moment a number of uh, LP1 applications, uh, uh, also uh, NBIOT, LTM applications in uh, a number of, uh, of sectors. Uh, I mean, the photos, introductory photos of this webinar is about agriculture, which is probably one of uh, uh, the most appealing one for those type of technologies. But really, this, this, fig, this uh, graphical representation in front of you should give you the sense of that uh, uh, spread of horizon of applications that uh, these technologies can enable. And the last message for me is also that those technologies will enable the, uh, to develop the IoT at a uh, small, medium enterprise level, which has always been a bit of a, of a challenge. Uh, I, I like to say that LP1 is uh, really an SME-friendly connectivity way of doing the IoT. Uh, and um, we, we are observing that as, as, uh, um, as analysts. Uh, we, I want to conclude that we, you will have a lot of uh, choices in front of you in terms of LP1 options, but definitely the ones that today we discuss are the ones that uh, uh, can, can enhance that, uh, uh, that variety of choice, which is not necessarily should be seen as confusion, but actually has the opportunity to really design your IoT solutions based on the needs you have and the value you want to produce out of your IoT applications. And really, this, this, is, this is for me, is, uh, the, the, the two messages is uh, the increasing role of these technologies, uh, so it's important for you to understand what it's about, what you can do, and uh, uh, really the, 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 the awareness that you can do a lot with, with this type of, uh, uh, of connect, uh, with this type of connectivities. Um, and uh, I really I stop here, and um, I'll give you the word to the first speaker. You have three very eminent speakers uh, in front of you, which will give you quite an interesting view on uh, primarily NBIUT and LTM, and uh, how we'll start to, with uh, Nicola Damour, uh, and uh, thank you so much for, for your time for listening to me, and I'm happy to take questions uh, at the end or later. Thank you so much. Please, Nicola. Hello. Think, um, thank you very much. Me, uh, next, Severio. Thank you. Nicola will be yes. uh, after the first poll. Um, so uh, I will just take us to that now, and then I'd be delighted to hand over to Nicola. Um, the first poll question is, where are you at in your IoT journey? Now, please remember, your replies are, of course, anonymous. So just click one answer, whichever is closest to your own experience, and we'll see the results immediately after. Um, the answers that you can choose from are, it's not applicable, I'm just here to learn, uh, Second, I am trying to understand how IoT could transform my products or business. And thirdly, I build connected devices today and want to know if LPWA is a technology I should be considering. So where are you at in your IoT journey? Um, let's go and have a look and see what replies we've got so far. Well, um, that's quite encouraging, a uh, strong... Um, indication of 45% saying that they're building connected devices today and you want to know if LPWA is a technology you should be considering. Um, second only behind that is I'm trying to understand 
how IoT could transform my products or business. Um, I wondered, um, Dima, if, if that is in line with your expectations. Well, I would want everyone to start working on that. That makes perfect sense. Um, Nicholas, was this what you were expecting? Yes, I guess you know this reflects the fact that, uh, well, as as uh, I was just said, uh, when we are actually building things now, I mean, it's not just some prospective technology; it's being deployed. And well, I'm I'm happy to see that there are uh, roughly half of the people who already know some stuff about it and are actually building it. So yeah, that's quite in line with what I was expecting. Yeah. Any anything you would add to that, Brian? Uh, yeah, just that uh, if we look at that, um, you know, on the other hand, we have half of our listeners who are really just trying to understand their, the business case and how this can transform their business. And I think that's perfectly in line with the reality in our market today. So, you know, one of the things we're trying to do here today is help our listeners um, navigate uh, all of this technology to find the, the business outcome they need. Well, uh, that's helpful. Um this is the, the moment when I would like to hand over to the expertise of Nicholas, if I may. So, uh, Nicholas, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So, so hello. So, I'm Nicholas Demore from Sierra Wireless, and, and uh, over the next couple of minutes, uh, I will give you an overview of the benefits um, of uh, two of the uh, uh, cellular LPWA technologies, which are LTM and narrowband IoT. So, looking at the uh, at the uh, landscape of low power wide area technologies, so so-called LPWA, there are really two big directions uh, where you can look at. Uh, the first one are um, standards based technologies, um, which are LTM and narrowband IoT, and also ECGSM IoT, which is not very famous, uh, but that's basically the 2G variant uh, of LPWA which is mostly uh, useful, I would say, in, in countries where uh, 2G networks are going to, uh, to be around for uh, a number of years to come. Now, um, if you look at the other side, uh, other technologies have been around for uh, a little longer. Um, these technologies have been faster to deploy on the market, and these are LoRa uh, or LoRa1 from Semtech and LoRa Alliance. Um, Sigfox and um, uh, in, in North America, Ingenu is also uh, very well uh, used. So these technologies um, have been fast to deploy on the market. Um, they, they have actually brought forward uh, uh, the, the evidence of how useful it is to have uh, technologies, wireless technologies that can operate on batteries for a long time and, and have a very wide coverage. Uh, but you know, they are proprietary. So uh, so what we are going to talk about today more uh, are the standardized technologies that are uh, probably more widespread and, um, and, and what are the benefits of those technologies in detail. So I start with, um, with an, um, maybe an, an overview of why, uh, why it is important to have LPWA wireless technologies that are standards based. Um, so the standards organization that is actually developing those technologies is a 3GPP, so the same organization that deploys mobile technologies in general. And the, the benefits you can see here on this slide are that first, that these technologies are globally available. So network operators um, throughout the globe deploy the same technologies. And so that's really important uh, to have something that works everywhere in the same way so that you can use devices on any networks. Uh, another aspect is the security of the transmissions. So uh, cellular technologies have been uh, developed over uh, decades now, and, and the um, and encryption and the security, but also the availability, because security is not just about encryption, it's also about the availability. So having your communications and your data secure is an important aspect that can be covered by standards. There's also another aspect, that, and, and that's very important in, in a number of markets uh, where devices are deployed for 10, 15, 20 years, is how long is a network going to last? How long is the technology going to last? And with those standards-based technology, based on regular cellular networks, uh, you know already that 
these devices will continue to operate on the same network for decades to come. In fact, and we'll see that uh, uh, in the questions uh, section of the of the presentation, um, these LTEM and narrowband IoT technologies are already 5G compliant. So there is no need to replace your devices when new wire technologies are, are deployed. Also. You know that these technologies do not depend on a single company uh, being around. So if some network operators get acquired, merged, or if there is any change in the industry, because it's a big ecosystem of uh, players, you know that uh, if you have to change supplier, you will still keep the same technology. Um, three other advantages also is that uh, with those technologies, you can go mobile. In fact, the GSM Association uh, dubs those cellular LPWA technologies, they dub them mobile IoT technology, which is very important in a number of use cases like um, um, asset tracking or uh, people tracking, even um, automotive use cases. So plenty of applications requiring mobility, what's called handover and even roaming, the ability to go on another network with the same device and the same subscription, which is also a big advantage of the standard. Um, you also have a guarantee of network quality because these technologies operate in licensed spectrum uh, and also because of the way the technology is made. Um, the devices listen to the network and they get allocation, allocated resources from the network. In um, non-standardized technologies such as Sigfox, LoRa or Ingenu, um, the devices try to send uh, data in most cases and, and hope for the best. So there's no actual guarantee of delivery uh, uh, for these technologies in most cases. And, and uh, the last aspect that's also very important is the ability to, uh, to have real-time applications. So not only um, do cellular technology provide a way for bidirectional communications where you can also contact the device from the network, from the cloud, in real time, um, that, that's very important as well. So, of course, uh, there are other aspects, and we'll go into these aspects of LP, so low power and, and, and coverage. But always keep in mind that these things, uh, while we focus on the technologies called LPWA, and we focus very much on what we're going to call the 4C, so cost coverage, current, and capacity, uh, there are a lot of other big advantages to using standardized solutions. So now uh, I just told you talking about the four C's of LPWA. So what we call the four C's you can see here, and there these are the primary targets for these technologies because really the need that's been uh, that's been recognized uh, a couple of years ago already was for te wireless technologies where you can exchange data uh, on a on a budget uh, with a very very wide or very long or very deep penetration so coverage then you have current so the ability to uh, operate devices on batteries for decade for a decade for years and years at a time and also the capacity of the network so the ability of the technology to scale to actually uh, accommodate these um, billions of devices that everyone is talking about so now i'll go into uh, some detail not not too much into detail but explain a little bit how these four c's are actually achieved the first c is cost so cost and, and it's true that uh, when you look at a cellular device especially 4G uh, broadband mobile broadband device they're quite costly and for a number of applications you don't need all of that power brought by cellular applications so the 3GPP has worked on reducing the complexity of those devices and you can see on the slide here how it's been done so with less components in the module design uh, with what's called half duplex communication on the radio channel lower bandwidth, lower speed, which are still good enough for most cases, maybe not for high definition video, but most IoT use cases, and single antenna. And thanks to all of these simplifications and reductions in, in, in complexity, uh, those devices, those chipsets and modules um, have benefits from, uh, from a reduction on cost of, of over uh, 50%. So really, w when you now think uh, of the devices, cellular devices in terms of cost, um, you should really look at a, a price point that's close to um, regular 2G or even Wi-Fi or Bluetooth devices. 
Another aspect, of course, is not just um, the cost of the device itself, but the cost of the subscription. And here as well, uh, simplifications in the telecom networks for these technologies uh, make it possible for network operators to offer subscriptions at a very, uh, very low cost. So that's for cost. The next important thing um, is about coverage. So coverage, it's all about being able to reach that um, smart meter, smart power meter in uh, in your basement or, or in the parking lot, uh, or being able on the countryside to reach devices that are far away deployed, possibly in the mountain, if you think of um, uh, hydroelectrical power plants that you monitor. So all of these things required uh, a far better coverage than what cellular uh, used to do. And to be able to achieve that, again, there's a number of uh, technologies that were uh, used. Um, so the, the most basic one is really repeating the physical signal. Of course, it's not like repeating the exact same physical signal every time. So you can repeat, you, you change frequency, and then so there's this mechanism called HARC, so hybrid automatic repeat request. So that in the end, when you repeat a sufficient number of times the same, uh, the same frame, uh, with slight variations, the receiver can reconstruct the original frame. And with that, you achieve what's called, so you measure coverage improvement in terms of decibels, so dBs, and you achieve uh, um, 20 decibels or more of coverage improvement, which means uh, in, in practical terms, uh, in, in free range, something between five to 10 times as far as a coverage as you used to have. So that, that's a great improvement. Uh, other technologies used are also so the downlink power spectral density, so PSD, and the boosting and selective scheduling. But again, uh, these are very technical terms, and we don't have much time to go into that. But that's how coverage is achieved. Um, in all, the, 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 uh, the conclusion is that you get a, a wide better coverage than you, what you used to have with cellular technologies. Now, the, the third C uh, is about current. So here, uh, it's again, the goal is to be able to operate devices uh, for more than 10 years on a battery. And for that, uh, also some savings have been done. And, and in essence, you've got two technologies that will be explained uh, by Dima's next speaker, but mostly you use what's called power saving mode with PSM, which is basically the hibernate mode of your laptop, more or less, something similar, and also uh, flexible sleep, so EDRX, extended uh, discontinuous reception, uh, but I will let Dima talk more about that as well. You can also optimize um, the communication for small data, and putting all of that together uh, we have made measurements already that some devices exchanging data uh, once a day, a couple of data, can last for um, up to 19 years. So we're really in, in, in a good area here. That was for current. The next in the last C is also capacity. Uh, right now, people are, may, may not be too concerned about capacity, but there's also something. If you look forward, I was, I was talking about um, uh, technologies that are uh, forward-looking and, and future-proof. If you want these technologies to be future-proof, the technology must be scalable. Um, the proprietary technologies so far uh, that were deployed in unlicensed spectrum um, have not proven that they can accommodate billions of devices on a very small number of, uh, of uh, cellular, of, of cells, of towers. So network capacity is something that's also very important, and that's actually one criteria to be able to claim 5G compliance. The metric here used by 3GPP and the ITU is that that technology should support a million devices or a million users per square kilometer. And um, these technologies uh, have already been proven to be scalable enough that we can accommodate that. Uh, thanks again to some technical optimizations in signaling, narrowband transmission, frequency hopping as well, and adaptive and higher order modulation. So all of that bring us the certainty that in 10, 15, 20 years from now, when we've got so many of these devices, they're still not going to bump into each other. So uh, that was very quickly, so the four main advantages, so in terms of cost, coverage, current, and capacity. Now, of course, we're going to see, so uh, a lot of people uh, can see, so okay, I've got narrowband IoT, LTEM, um, also known as EMTC or even CATM. Depending on your network operator, uh, he may offer, they may offer one or the other technology. So what's the biggest difference? And probably we'll get into that in the question section as well. But 
At a high level, narrowband IoT is really focused on extremely low data rates. Well, extremely low still meaning about 20 kilobits per second or so. So it's not like uh, a couple of bytes per second. Um, but still, so for smaller data rates in uh, use cases like uh, uh, water metering or pipeline management, um, smart agriculture, uh, where you just send data from sensor, very small data, that's perfectly fine. Very ideal for that case. LTM, on the other hand, provides more um, more capacity, uh, more bandwidth. Um, it's also it also provides uh, uh, mobility full mobility support. Uh, you can do voice. Think about uh, wearables, so smartwatches um, driven by your voice. So where you need a little bit more of capacity, LTM would be your right choice. That's basically the difference between the two. Now, so. Um, in essence, uh, as we will see in a moment, a lot of network operators will be offering both technologies anyways. And uh, as Dima will explain in a moment, most device makers and chipset suppliers provide chipsets and modules and devices that support both. So really, how would you choose one technology over the other if, if you want to or if you have to choose? It's really a question of which technology is available by which network operator in your region and um, how expensive uh, the subscription would be. Uh, there's also a question of flexibility. So do you want to maybe use LTEM uh, to be more flexible in your data rate? Uh, or are you certain that you really uh, want to report only small amounts of data all the time, in which case narrowband IoT is just fine? Now. Talking about regional deployments, so uh, as you can see today, so uh, here's a, a small map of, of the uh, current deployments uh, that are tracked by the GSM Association of a, um, of a North America, um, Europe, and in, in the uh, Asia Pacific region. So in some countries, like in, in the US, for example, um, you only have an LTM network by uh, two network operators over there. Uh, in some other countries, like China or Germany, you have currently only narrowband IoT provided by these regional network operators, but already some network operators in Turkey, uh, or uh, you can see, so in Turkey, one network operator provides both. Uh, there's also in Spain, uh, we, we, we know that network operators will offer both technologies. And uh, in some countries, like um, it's also the case in, in Belgium or in the Netherlands or in uh, Australia, one network operator will offer one technology and the other will offer the other one. But eventually, so that's today, and you can see there's also quite a number of networks live and, and operating. Now, looking for forward uh, to the end of this year, so in eight months, uh, in 11 months from now, because a lot of network operators are now adopting those technologies, our view, talking to network operators worldwide, shows that in most countries, even by the end of this year, you will be able to use one or the other technology um, independently, so really, regardless of, of any choice you can make. So that's about the, 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 the uh, deployment plan for this LPWA technology. And um, I think at this point, I will give it over back to Jeremy for another poll. Nicholas, thank you. Um, that next poll uh, is coming up right now. Let's have a look and see. Um, what technology, which technology are you thinking of deploying? Uh, uh, deploying on LTEM, NBIOT, both LTEM and NBIOT, something else, including 3G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and LoRa, or lastly, not applicable, I'm just here to learn. So the question is, which technology are you thinking of deploying on? LTEM, NBIOT, both, something else, 3G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, etc., or it's not applicable? I hope that gives you enough time to give us your thoughts. Let's have a look and see what the answers are. And by some margin, 42%, we're seeing uh, both LTEM and NBIOT. Nicholas, is this the sort of figure that you expected? Yeah, well, that's interesting to, to see what's the reality. But uh, I guess depending on the application, really, in some cases, LTEM may be more appropriate and some others, narrowband IoT may be more in some cases, it, it really doesn't matter. So yeah, that's quite interesting. Interesting is also to see that uh, there are uh, a number of other technologies 
that are very complementary, of course, so it's still out there. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Brian, uh, what was your thought on when you saw the, this result come through? Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think um, what we're seeing <clears throat> is a bit of a reflection that our, our audience doesn't necessarily want to have to make the choice, but wants that flexibility of being able to go either LTM or NBIOT, depending on the specific use case or application. So that's how I read it. makes sense. Dima, is there anything you want to add? I think it's very interesting and encouraging. Uh, most of the technologies are looking towards the cellular technologies and not others. And also, given very early deployment stages, it makes sense that people want to have both. And some prefer CACHEM just because it's more advanced in timeline, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's go back to Nicholas, who has uh, some more comments on this. Yeah, so um, what, um, what uh, as a conclusion, so if I would summarize a little bit uh, my point is that um, the, the, the design consideration, so the, the key points you probably should bear in mind when choosing uh, how to design your, your device and which technology. So, of course, uh, you, you want to be low power. So how are you going to achieve low power? What's your traffic pattern? Um, another important question is whether you can fall back to 2G networks. Because uh, as you could see on the map I've shown, um, uh, in, in some countries you, you are not going to have uh, you're not going to have 4G technologies for quite some time, uh, and even in developed countries it may take some time before you have a national coverage of all these technologies. I mean, sometime it may be a year, it may be 18 months, but still in that time you may want to have uh, the certainty that you can fall back on the 2G network. Uh, so that flexibility we just talked about between LTM and R band IoT, so that's probably something uh, that's important important to bear in mind. And also the embedded SIM, it's also another aspect I didn't really talk about um, so far, but um, the, with cellular networks, you're free to change network operators whenever you want, thanks to the embedded SIMs. So in just a word, the embedded SIMs, also called eSIM or EUICC for uh, embedded uh, universal integrated circuit card, uh, these are SIM cards, um, because you always need SIM cards uh, with cellular devices, but SIM cards that can be reprogrammed over the air so that you change from network operators, say Deutsche Telekom, to AT&T, for example. So that's very important uh, to have this flexibility. Um, the support of uh, um, uh, global positioning systems, uh, navigation systems, is also a key element. And uh, finally, uh, whether there are existing reference designs that you can based on to develop your, your device quicker, and whether uh, the module you're actually uh, using is scalable, meaning whether you can switch from uh, LTN or Band IoT technology to uh, potentially 3G or to a more broadband version of, uh, of the same device. So all of that, these are, in, in my opinion, factors you should uh, try to bear in mind when you design your, your solution. And uh, I think that's all for me, so uh, I'm going to give the floor now to Dima. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nicolas. Uh... Hi, I'm uh, Dima Feldman from Altar Semiconductors, and I'm going to talk about uh, consideration and how to design low-power IoT devices. Uh, first of all, uh, being a chipset company, when we came uh, to architecture of the product, we, we carefully took a look on what is important for the IoT devices versus regular cellular devices. And the thing we have noticed is it's really important to keep a very low standby power consumption because devices are dormant most of the time. The second item would be how much energy do you need to invest or spend to send a short amount of data. Think of a gas meter sending its reading, really short, small amount of data you need to send, and you have to do it very efficiently. And the last and probably not least is how efficient your photo. Deploying devices that should last for 10 or 15 years, what is essential for network upgrades and also security upgrades of the devices. And this is different from smartphones where being designed different and for different use cases where you would really take a deep care of a power consumption for file upload and download 
video audio streaming, voice calls, and browsing. And when we start designing an IT application, there are many considerations you should take a look at. Some of them are related to the cellular technologies. Some of them are more general and related to how you develop your application. And when you start, you start from picking your hardware, I think. And when you're doing that, please take a careful look on relevant power consumption parameters that we're going to focus a little bit later on. And make sure that your chipset is built for IoT devices and serves your needs. The other point which can also impact the power consumption of the device is how it's being deployed and where. And one of the impacts or significant impacts on your power consumption would be quality of the network coverage. And here again, having dual mode devices or even triple mode devices, if the device can choose a better, the best network based on its location, it will help the power consumption. The third point I would like to touch, and this would be the point in which I'll deep dive in the next slide, is how to choose the right the IT right configuration, and this includes the power, the power saving modes, and I'll touch timers a little bit. The other parameters are more a service level and network level, and one of them would be where your cloud servers are located. If you have very long round trip distance to your cloud servers, you'll spend significant amount of data just waiting for that. Therefore, you deploy and having a deployment in a certain country, it's better to have adjacent or nearby cloud services. And same stands for a DNS request. If your device needs to make a DNS request, or every time it sends data, it will spend more time on DNS request than on actual data transmissions. The other parameters would include the proper selection of the protocols, and also number six would be power optimal security scheme that meets your device needs. For example, if you choose shorter keys and still very secure, you can save quite some amount of data. And also if you don't exchange a C certificate very often and use efficiently suspend or resume mechanisms of the certification of the security protocols, it will also help the power consumption. And same stands for choosing the right transport layer. Sometimes you would like to work over TCP, sometimes over UDP, and sometimes just send a text message could be very efficient. And the last point I would say, design a power application. If you really want to do very lean and efficient application, you have to take care of all the layers of the application you are designing. And as I promised earlier, I'm just going to focus on uh, techniques, techniques we get from the LT standard and what we can implement in the devices. And the two very efficient techniques for low power saving are power saving mode within the device. This mode is, very su is mostly suitable for devices with device originated traffic, like sensors or parking meters, but not only, it's not limited to that. And in this mode, devices going dormant for some amount of time, can be even days, wakes up and sends a short message or send, sends whatever it needs to send to the network, waits for some network response, this being page in monitoring, and then goes to sleep. And for, for days, basically from hours to days. The other mode is a extended discontinuous reception or EDRX. This mode is very similar to what we have in our smartphones but the paging cycles are longer. So devices being able to wait for from 10 seconds to minutes between the paging opportunities by the network, and this is very much suitable for devices that need to respond to network requests. An example could be a tracker or a child tracker. When you want to find your device, you just send a message to the device asking for the location. And some devices can trace, devices are able to advise the mode they want to work with. And some of them are even being able to switch the mode dynamically. For example, sometimes you want to spend in PSM when your tracker is not moving, and other times at EDRX modes. The other question I do want to answer and probably expand a little bit more the previous slide is how do you choose if you want to work with EDRX or PSM? And to when Trying to answer that, we examine two parameters of 
power sensitive devices. One would be the application latency, how much time you can wait or you can allow to wait before device unsource. And the other important parameter is how often you exchange the, the information. And when I look on the, the examples, the first parameter is, or on the application latency scale, the first parameter is non-reachable devices. Think of devices like smoke detectors, uh, Amazon or dash buttons, many of the metering applications, they never respond to the network. They just push the data to the network. And for those devices, PSM is probably the most power efficient mode. However, some tracking applications like good goods containers which you want to track or pallets or smart garbage cans do want to receive messages from the network, but they are sensitive to the delays. And if this sensitivity is above one hour or several hours, you probably want to work in a PSM mode where your container will send a message to the network, hey, do you have any questions for me or do you want to receive the data? or should I turn on or off my GPS receiver? And the other type is a car tracker. Probably this is more complicated one. In this device, this device pu can push data to the network very frequently. For example, your car is moving and you send an update every minute or so. However, it sometimes also need to pull for a network for configuration or upgrades. And this device still can work in a PSM mode in a very efficient way. The other class or the other examples I do want to show is EDRX device, are EDRX devices. One could be a gas meter with remote shutdown capability. You can wait a minute for a network to shut it down. And also can be a sport band where you do want to receive your notifications but still be very efficient. You track your devices and it could also be a shared bicycle, for example, which you do want to be able to open from the network. And for my last slide before we move to the poll, I want to show you what can be done with uh, if you do design your devices efficiently in terms of uh, power consumption for cellular technology. Uh, one example we we'll really like to use is board bands or smartwatches. And I think we can really change the industry here with newer technology we have in, in hand. Uh, with a very small batteries, we now see and forecast a smart bands lasting for up to 100 days, sending one kilobyte of data every 15 minutes. This is not a device you use to charge. You need to charge every day. It's really new technology. The other example is a dash button, which can stand for uh, or work for three years with about 10K clicks on a AAA battery. This is even better than what you could do today with Wi-Fi. The other example, and it's very popular, we see emerging need for a smart utility which can communicate with the network in bi-directional communication. For example, device which is reachable by the network, meaning in DRX, sending about four messages a day, on a single CR7450 battery can last for seven years. Two batteries, you easily extend 10 years of operation for always connected device. And I do want to emphasize that. It's not a device that goes to sleep and being disconnected and wakes up every day, but being connected to the network all the time and being able to respond to network requests. And the last few example I do want to use and remind you of the old batteries we have been using our photo cameras, uh, probably 10 years ago, it's CR2. It's a small lithium battery. It can power uh, smoke detectors or water meters for about 15 years. It can give three years of operation for garbage bin and about one year of operation for your pet trackers. And by, by showing all this example, we really want to do and show that you, that you can move from, that you don't need you don't need to think of recharging devices every day or every week. You can really go to monthly or yearly operation or multiple years of operation on a single battery. And uh, I think we will move to our next poll now. Thank you very much. Yes, that's uh, the plan. Let's have a look at the next poll. 
and that is which power modes best fit your application. Is it PSM, DRX and EDRX, or both would work for my application? Are you not sure and would need to do more research? Or finally, is this not applicable? I'm just here to learn. So which power modes best fit your application? PSM, DRX, EDRX, both not sure or not applicable. Now, at the risk of rushing you, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions at the end. So let's go to the replies. And the early indications, yes, the um, not sure would need to do more research is uh, just in front uh, with 29% almost. And very shortly after that, behind that is not applicable. I'm here to learn. So um, clearly, we're still in a, uh, a more of an exploratory phase uh, for quite a number of users. 25% um, have said both would work for my application, and similar numbers for both PSM and DRX, EDRX. I'm not going to go to the uh, panel for this because uh, I want to allow enough time for questions at the end. So what I will do instead is turn straight to Brian. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeremy. So, um, and thank you, Nicola and Dima, for giving us a great overview of uh, the LT1 technology. And what I'd like to do is spend a few moments talking about clearly this technology gives us the potential to design very low power uh, applications. But it's up to us to make the most of these technologies by being efficient in our data management. So let me, let me illustrate by way of analogy. So suppose we, uh, we want to reduce energy consumption in our home. So we, we uh, invest in a brand new smart home. We add uh, LED lighting throughout. We get smart appliances, uh, energy efficient heating and cooling, smart thermostats, the works. So here we are, we've got potential to lower our energy bill. But of course, if we turn around and we crank the heat and we keep the lights on all day, every day, we're still gonna consume plenty of energy. So that's clearly not what we want to do. So it's exactly the same with our LP WAN applications. The technology, the underlying technology gives us fantastic potential, but we need to be smart about how we use it. And the watchword here is data. When we send data, as we've already discussed, we consume energy. So we want to do that in an efficient way. We want to send the right data at the right time with the right priority in our applications. So if we think about that from a system level, there's a couple of uh, considerations we want to make. Of course, every application is different, but I think there's some um, common denominators here that we can think about. So the first thing is to recognize that our LP WAN edge devices uh, will be generating a lot of data, will be measuring a lot of data, and not all of that data needs to be sent, and it certainly doesn't need to be sent right away. So uh, we need to deploy at our edge devices some rules, some guidelines to, to uh, decide what data should be uh, filtered out, what can be stored and sent later, maybe some that needs to be prioritized and sent right away, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, we, let's call that capability stream processing. We're, we're taking as an input a stream of data. We're doing some processing at the edge before we decide to send that data on our network. The other observation we want to make is that those rules at our edge devices will evolve over time. They'll evolve because our devices are going to change. They may evolve depending on the network that we're deployed on. They may evolve because we want to deploy new applications. And, and last but not least, we're going to learn over time how to evolve our application to make the best use of the, the, uh, the technology. Just like in a smart home, our smart thermostat learns our behavior and optimizes over time. So we need some central way to, to adjust these rules at the edge and optimize. And uh, what I'd like to propose is that we need a lightweight way of doing that. We don't want to have to 
deploy a firmware update to, to change a, a temperature threshold, we want to be able to tweak and manage these rules at the edge. And so that, that capability, let's call that data orchestration, okay? So from an end-to-end -end perspective, you have stream processing at the edge, you'll need data orchestration in your cloud, and these two will need to work together to really get this efficient use of, of the LPWAN technology. So I'm gonna illustrate that by way of example, how we can uh, work with these concepts. Before we do that though, let's just calibrate on what we're talking about by uh, edge and edge computing. So if we go online today and we Google edge computing, we're going to see uh, plenty of material. Um, it's a pretty hot topic. But uh, in the main, we're looking at uh, edge routers and gateways that are, uh, you know, find themselves in connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles and connected factories and so on. And so these are, these tend to be pretty high performance computing devices. Um, and certainly they are not low power devices. They have full access to mains power and they're running a lot of, of compute at the edge. So this is clearly not what we're talking about in our LPWAN applications. We're talking about devices uh, in connected packages or connected agricultural sensors uh, or connected smart meters, et cetera. So we're talking about uh, battery powered constrained devices. So when we think about edge computing for LPWAN, let's just be clear that we're not talking about uh, you know, traditional edge computing. We're talking, you could call it about the deep edge. We're talking about constrained battery powered devices. And so we need to right size our uh, compute technology for these low power applications. So that's just a bit of nomenclature there. Let's, let's go back to our example. And the example I'd like to offer is um, medical lab transport. So just a quick briefing on this. Um, here we're talking about uh, the lab services industry. We're all reasonably familiar with um, anytime we go for a blood test that we, we give a specimen and that specimen gets tested, not necessarily at the point that it was taken. So as a result, we have, uh, as an industry, lab services companies need to move uh, specimens back and forth between hospitals and labs, et cetera. And obviously this needs to be done in a timely manner and these specimens need to be temperature controlled and, and basically handled with the greatest care. Um, and, and there's a lot of issues today. This is a problem that I think we as an industry can solve with LPWAN. So if we're going to design an application for this, clearly we're talking about battery power, we're talking about low power. How might we use stream processing and data orchestration? So as a simple example, um, we want to monitor the temperature inside um, inside these uh, coolers or these totes. Um, and we want to do that on a regular basis. But we don't necessarily need to send that temperature reading every time we measure it. We probably want to log that, maybe send it once a day as a, as a temperature uh, log. However, if we get an over temperature, a significant over temperature that could damage the specimens, we need to send that right away. So. By, by setting a threshold uh, by which uh, we, we, we set an alarm. Um, that's a very simple example of, of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about stream processing. Uh, similarly, we might uh, want to control or put a barrier around where the geographic region where these are get, get transported. So you could set a geofence and have the device actually compute whether or not the geofence boundary is crossed and send an alert. Okay. So that's your stream processing the edge. What about data orchestration? Well, clearly, depending on the, the customer, depending on the type, of, uh, you know, the type of specimens inside here, you're going to want to tweak those rules, change the temperature, uh, update the geofence, et cetera. You might also want to add new features such as, for example, a tamper alert. So to send an alert if uh, a light sensor uh, detects that the, the, the box is open or if it's been dropped, these kinds of things. It's a very trivial example, but just to illustrate uh, how, how do we use these capabilities uh, in conjunction to, again, make the best, smartest use of our network, send the right data at the right time with the right priority. And finally, uh, for me, just a couple of other uh, power optimization considerations that could all deserve more, uh, more attention. So the first the most obvious, we're talking about optimizing power, we're talking about optimizing battery, but we can't 
manage what we don't measure. So make sure in your application that you have a way of monitoring your, your edge uh, battery consumption and you have that information coming to your centralized system so you can make smart decisions based on the level of battery you have left or the consumption rate you're at. Um, secondly, and my colleagues have already talked about that, security is a consideration simply because there's a lot of overhead, can be a lot of overhead involved in securing your application. So um, something to keep in mind is making sure that your data exchange, uh, even your software updates are uh, lightweight enough that you don't overconsume power. And then finally, um, related to data is location. Um, GNSS is obviously the uh, most accurate and uh, best uh, location technology for outdoor applications. But there are many others that, that give uh, different trade-offs. And I think it's important to consider cell ID, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi as complements to GNSS that might actually help you improve your overall power consumption. So that's it for me, Jeremy. Thanks. Uh, I'll turn it back to you for the questions. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, yeah, well, look, let's go straight to that. We've got barely five minutes, and we've got about 60 questions to get through, and they're still coming in. So clearly an interesting topic. Um, from a well-known European network equipment provider, um, the question is, does NB-IoT or LTE, LTEM have any specific advantages with regards to evolution to 5G? Um, would you care to take that, Nicholas? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I guess from a pure technology, as they are specified, not necessarily. Uh, both technologies are, are 5G compatible. Now, one thing you may want to look at quite in detail is when you uh, acquire a device, some devices can be upgradable. I'm looking at, for example, CAT NB1 devices. Um, there's a technology called CAT NB2, which is an evolution towards 5G of that technology to accommodate for higher bandwidth and more mobility. So you may want to uh, check that your device will be upgradable to CAT NB2, for example. But the technologies per se, they're, they're 5G uh, compliant just fine. Uh, just, just check which device you're actually uh, buying. Okay. Um, and a question here, will EDRX and PSM ever get added to LTE CAT1 and up devices. Dima, could you take that, please? Actually, actually uh, some of our, our, our own CAT1 chipset already supports that. Uh, sorry, I could hardly hear you there. Uh, oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Oh, great. I, I was saying that our uh, CAT1 chipset already supports EDRX and PSM. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's... Um, there's a question here that asks, what is the throughput max uh, and latency capabilities for LTEM? Well, I've got you, Dima. Is that something that you'd care to answer? Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, the throughput is, uh, the maximum throughput is uh, about 300 or 375 kilobit per second, depending on network configuration. And the maximum latency could be, well, it starts from a milliseconds in a very good coverage and can be increased if you're in coverage enhanced mode. And uh, there's a question here that asks, vast M2M applications I on SMS. So you, do you see SMS as a feature for the new NB IoT CAT M networks being supported? Uh, Who care to take that? I could take it, Nicholas speaking. So I guess um, SMS will be supported by LTE CAT M1 uh, modules and networks uh, because there's still a use case for that now. now um, it's, it, the tendency, the, the trend is really to move away from SMSs as much as possible to favor uh, data uh, applications not relying on SMS. SMS is, for example, quite difficult to secure to name just one of the aspects why SMS is not great. I see. Well, um, I regret that we are actually out of time. We still have so many questions to get to, but we will get your answer, get you answers to those 
Q-Q. The aim of this webinar has been to help you deploy a low-power application for LTEM and NB IoT networks. And we talked through some of the challenges as well as how to overcome them. Sadly, that's all we have time for. Don't forget to bookmark our website at iot-now.com. You'll find the latest news there and plenty more besides. It just remains for me to say a huge thank you to our speakers. Severio Romeo from Beach and Research. Thanks, Severio. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. And Nicholas uh, from Sierra Wireless. Great to have you here, Nicholas. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, too, to uh, Dima Feldman at Alter Semiconductor. We really appreciate your time, Dima. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having us. And last but by no means least, from Sierra Wireless, Brian O'Flaherty. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Jeremy. Hope to do it again soon. Yeah, I look forward to it. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, I really want to thank you for joining us around the world. Keep safe, and we really appreciate the time you spent with us. Bye for now.